Good evening. Thank you to everyone who has come tonight. My name is Jacob Swibel, your 94th Godot of DC Council. My name is Lexi Rubin, your 75th Nasiya of DC Council. My name is Brett Harder, your 33rd Godot of Nova Council. And my name is Abby Hogan, your 33rd Nasiya of Nova Council. <laughs> We want to welcome everybody to the Bender JCC of Greater Washington, our nation's capital, and where many NRE re members call home. A little over a month ago, our lives as Jews were forever changed when Hamas terrorists attacked our homeland. Fellow Jews of all ages were savagely murdered and taken hostage, and it subsequently ignited violent acts of anti-Semitism across the globe and here in America. In this dark moment, the entire northern reach Region East stands in unwavering solidarity with the Jewish community in the wake of the highest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust and the sharpest rise in anti-Semitism since that period. We also express our deep concern for the horrifying violence by Hamas that is causing suffering for innocent lies, lives in Gaza. It is essential to recognize that supporting the Jewish community and its allies does not imply indifference to the suffering of any other group. Our hearts are heavy and grieving for everybody who has been impacted by the consequences of Hamas terrorism. In these times of peril, when our Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel are dehumanized and their existence challenged, it is vital that our Jewish community comes together. In our centennial year, as the biggest Jewish teen-led movement in world history, we must mobilize our resources and show the world that we matter. That we, the Jewish people, matter that the right of a Jewish state to exist has never been more important. In 14 hours, our movement will arrive in our nation's capital, the world's most salient symbol of democracy, advocating for a Jewish community and over 100,000 people. Now is not the time to stay silent. While the world seems to scream with hate, our love tomorrow must be deafening. Our BBYO movement is again intertwined with world history because we are simply more than just a youth group. We are the future of the Jewish people. Am Yisrael, Yisrael High, our, our Jewish pride will be strong tomorrow. Am Yisrael High, our Jewish community will be strong tomorrow. Am Yisrael High, the Jewish people are alive and stronger than ever. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Grossman, BBYO's CEO, for a few remarks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as they said, my name is Matt Grossman. I have the pleasure of being BBYO CEO, and I've got to tell you, the perspective from this stage right now is, is a beautiful one. Um, we filled this hall tonight, and tomorrow we're going to fill them all. And I will tell you that when I was the age of many of you, I, I came to my first ever uh, march on Washington, D.C., which some of your parents uh, probably recall was the March for Soviet Jewry in uh, 1987, um, where we, the Jewish community, came to the tune of about a million people to protest uh, the fact that religious freedom was not allowed in the Soviet Union. And a few months after that, the Soviet Union fell, became the former Soviet Union, and one of the great uh, leaders of the Jewish people who was being held captive at that time, Natan Sharansky, was set free. And tomorrow, Natan Sharansky will be joining us all on the mall as we celebrate what it means to be a Jewish people. And that would not have been possible without the action of this community about uh, 35 years ago now. So that's where we stand. We know how to make big things happen. I saw it this morning when I was watching the local news and I saw the street closures that are going on in DC tomorrow. I knew that was us. We were making a difference. We were changing things. And what I will tell you more than anything is I've seen the 
the different rallies, the different gatherings play out around the world over the last several weeks, some of them in support of what we believe, of, what we believe in, what we hold uh, true to our hearts, and some not, is that at the end of the day, the only way to fight terror is with togetherness. And that's what we're gonna offer the world tomorrow, togetherness, togetherness as a community, togetherness as BBYO, togetherness as a Jewish people. And I just wanna thank all of you for joining that community, for being a part, not of the leadership of the future leadership of the Jewish people, but for the leadership the Jewish people needs now. It's all of you, it's all of us. That's what we're gonna offer the world tomorrow. It's gonna be a great day and thanks for showing up. Eliana, where are you? You're coming up next. Next up, I'm excited to welcome Lizzie Savetsky to the stage. Lizzie is a digital influencer with a passion for Jewish life, Israel, matchmaking, and fashion. She's best known for sharing her journey of fashionable Jewish motherhood on social media, often featuring her two young daughters and baby boy. Lizzie is an outspoken advocate for Israel and the Jewish people and against anti-Semitism. BBYO, please give warm welcome, warm welcome to Lizzie Savetsky. Is this thing on? <laughs> okay, hi Lizzie, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, it's an wanna, honor to be here. I wanna jump right in. So I know that you were in Israel on the attack that took place on October 7th. Could you tell us a bit about that and what your experience was like? Yeah, so it was definitely a life-changing experience. You know, I think October 7th was a life-changing day for all of us. None of us will ever forget where we were when we heard about the attack. Um, but for me, I was in my hotel in Jerusalem with my husband and my three kids, and I woke up to the sound of red alert alarms. And I spent a lot of time in Israel. I went there for the first time when I was 18 on birthright. I ended up living there the year after college. And fortunately, I had never been in a bomb shelter before. Uh, I managed to avoid that. So this was my first experience hearing those sirens. Um, and my oldest daughter was looking at me with sheer panic. She said, first she thought it was a drill because that when you hear a siren, that's what we think in America because we're not used to living in Israel. And I said, Stella, in Israel, they don't have drills. And she grabbed my three-year-old son and started sprinting down the hall. And then as she was doing that, the loudspeaker went off and said, everyone needs to report to the bomb shelter immediately. And my family were Shomer Shabbat, and it was also Simchas Torah, as you guys know. So we had no idea what was going on. We didn't have our phones. Um, we were completely unaware of the atrocities that had already happened the couple hours before this. So when we got to the bomb shelter, uh, there was some rumors starting to circulate about what was happening. And I remember someone saying that a soldier had been kidnapped. And we were all freaking out. A soldier has been kidnapped. How could they do this? Little did we know just how horrible it was. But you know, as the Jewish people, we value every single human life. Um, and one is way too many. So we, um, just like all of you, came to realize throughout the day just how severe things were. Um, and we were uh, in and out of the bomb shelter for that whole day. And um, we're learning more and more details. Um, it, was, it was really hard, but I will say that being in um, the shelter with a whole lot of Jews on the Jewish holiday, which Simchas Torah, you know, means happiness. It's supposed to be our happiest day of the year. It was, it was amazing to see that even in our darkest hour, we are so unified, we are so strong, in fact, stronger than ever. And they brought the Torah into the bomb shelter. They continued their prayer service. We were singing Am Yisrael Chai um, because that, that is who we are. You know, we have to hang on to our Jewish identity, especially when people are threatening our, our lives because of it. This is, this is who we are. 
and we will always stay strong. And fortunately, we made it back to the US um, on that Monday morning. We had been booked on El Al, which is the only airline that was flying, just happened to be. And um, I went straight from the plane to Fox News, and I've been very privileged to be able to devote every waking hour to fighting for the Jewish people, standing up for Israel um, ever since then. Haven't done a lot of sleeping or taking care of myself, but it's all encompassing for all of us. So, you know, whatever we can do to make an impact, we do it. Thank you so much. So to add on to that, I know that you actually started as sort of like a fashion influencer in these past few years, you've kind of sort of developed into more of having a really strong voice for Israel. So since the war started, how has this really like transformed your career on social media, being able to share and advocate for different people? So I went through a uh, tough time a few years ago. If you guys remember the conflict in Gaza during 2021, which at the time felt like the biggest deal that we had ever lived through um, in terms of Israel and Israel's vulnerability. You know, growing up, I'm old, guys. I'm 38, so I'm ancient compared to all of y'all. Maybe not to some of the people in the room. Sorry. <laughs> I'm very young. I have a lot of life in front of me, God willing. But I, <laughs> but like growing up, <laughs> Israel's, um, Israel's security was something that I took for granted because there was a lot of years, although we had sporadic bursts of terror attacks and suicide bombings, for the most part, Israel felt safe. Um, the Israel's existence, I should say, felt safe. And I never really thought of Israel as vulnerable. Maybe this was very naive of me. Um, but in 2021, I started to see how not only was Israel vulnerable to attacks in a much larger way than I had really been aware of, but also the world really turned on us. And I am on social media. I've been, you know, I, I sort of got into this whole digital influencing thing, whatever they call us, accidentally. I w had a full-time job and I started a blog on the side because I like to write. And so I was writing articles about accessories. It was called Accessories Expert. It was very cute at the time. Everyone had their little names. Um, nobody like went by their actual name because I, I guess that would be too obvious. I don't know. So I, um, so I was in the influencer space and I could not believe how quickly the world was demonizing Israel and all these people that I had looked up to, other influencers, celebrities, public figures, were using their social media influence to come out against Israel. And um, oh gosh, it was a really dark and lonely time for me. And so I made the decision to wrap myself in the Israeli flag and write a whole post about why I stand with Israel. And I knew at that point that I, there would be no turning back. I knew that I was going to um, have to, to lean into it because what happened was I immediately lost a lot of brand partnerships, lost a ton of followers, got dropped by my management company at the time. And it was, it was really dark. Nobody had prepared me for this. You know, there was no manual for how to, how to be a digital warrior on Instagram, f fighting for Israel when the world hates you. I, di I didn't know what I was doing. I was making it up as I went along. And um, it was really hard for me. It was tough on my mental health. Uh, but ultimately, it was the best decision I ever made because after that, I really decided that this is who I was. This was going, what I was going to commit my platform to. I felt like God had blessed me with this platform and this following. And I have a responsibility to use it to stand up for my people um, because I wasn't seeing really many other people do that. And so um, I had about two and a half years of training leading up to October 7th. And when the war broke out, it was like people knew where to look. People knew to come to my page to find out the breaking news, to find out up-to-date information, to, to watch my educational videos about Israel um, and about our connection to it, to, to break it all down in a very simple way. Um, and so, you know, I really do believe that I'm living my purpose. And as horrible as what we're going through is, 
Um, I, I, fe I feel very blessed to have um, a role that I can play that makes me feel useful because um, there's nothing worse than feeling helpless when you're watching your people suffer. That was really powerful, thank you. Um, okay, so since the start of the war and just in general, there's been a lot of um, anti-Semitism around the world and especially high index college campuses. As teenagers and people that are gonna be attending these colleges in like a year or two, like why do you think this is happening now and what should we do and how can we help? <sighs> the college campus uh, anti-Semitism epidemic is so intense. Um, how many of you guys have experienced anti-Semitism online? Raise your hand. Um, wow, look at this. That's a lot of hands. And that just goes to show you how widespread Jew hatred has become. And what's happened on college campuses uh, over the past decade, especially since I was a young lad, la laddie, what do they call it, lass? A young lass, gosh, I shouldn't try to speak other dialects. Um, I, uh, a lot has changed, you know, it was start, the demonization of Israel was starting to exist on campus when I was at NYU for undergrad and then Penn for grad school, but it was nothing like it is now. And what's happened is there's been a slow indoctrination of the students on campus into blindly aligning with terrorism, thinking that they're supporting the oppressed and having no idea what they're actually standing for, having no idea what they're actually fighting for, um, having no idea that what they're doing is not only hurting the Jewish people, but it's also hurting the innocent Palestinians. Um, and th they just don't have their eyes open at all. And when I look out at you guys, because you guys are gonna be in college in, in a couple years, um, I am hopeful because I have three young kids and I know that one day I hope that they're gonna be able to go to a college in America. I mean, it's, it's not looking good, but I think that you all have a job to do. You know, being Jewish is, is a big responsibility, and the fact that you're here, that you've taken time away from your life to, to be here tonight, to come to this rally, to be a part of BBYO, shows that, that you care about your Jewish identity and about the future of the Jewish people. Um, and you guys are gonna be our soldiers on, on college campuses. So the best thing that any of you can do is be armed with the facts so that you feel confident and empowered when the hate comes your way. Um, the, best, the best resource that I found is Noah Tishby's book, Israel. Have you guys read it or heard of it? Well, I highly recommend that, that each of you, before you go to a college campus, reads this book. It breaks it down super simply, and um, you'll know exactly where the holes are in, in these arguments. Um, and also, you know, just showing up as a proud Jew on uh, at your school now and in the future, God willing, on a college campus is a form of, uh, of resistance because that is the, what our enemies want is for us to be trembling in fear, to hide who we are, um, and we're not gonna do that. We are strong, we are proud, um, and so, you know, wear your Star of David, wear, you know, whatever visibly Jewish item that you have, you know, I, I want to encourage all of you to, um, to be the proudest, strongest Jews that you can be. Be loud about it. Use social media. Um, that it really makes a huge difference, and we need every single voice. You guys know we're never going to win the numbers game. So really, a, a round of applause for you just for all showing up here because... We need, we need every Jew to stand up, to show up, to speak up, and that is what you guys are here doing. And it makes me feel safe and secure for the future of the Jewish people, for my kids, seeing all of you guys paving the way for them. So thank you. I definitely agree. Thank you. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know, um, Lizzie is a proud alumna of BBYO North Texas, Oklahoma region. Is there any NTO people here? Yeah. Woo! Yeah, wait, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
I'm sorry, I've embarrassed you. <laughs> um, we're Texas really, Pride. <laughs> we're really lucky to have you back home in BBYO again. With that being said, do you feel like your time in BBYO has contributed to what you do now and the place you're at now? And would, what do you have to say to this generation of teens? We were just talking about this earlier. BBYO was so foundational for me, and I didn't, I obviously didn't know it at the time because I was young when I joined. I was just telling you that I was a sunshine chair girl. That was my first position. Are any, do I have any sunshine girls out here? Or, what's up, sunshine girls? I loved my, I loved my role as sunshine chair. Um, and, uh, and I held, I held numerous positions. I went to CLTC in Wisconsin, although, yes, although I, I must confess, I mostly went to flirt with boys, but I got in trouble last time I said that, but I have no filter, so I'm sorry. I promise I won't flirt with anyone tonight. You're safe. I, I don't want to get in trouble. So... Um, so yeah, I would say uh, BBYO. I love it. I'm sorry. I love I love your energy. I do. It's great. Especially this is like brings me back, and I, I'm feeling very nostalgic right now. But I loved my time in BBYO. It was so special for me because I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. I did not grow up around a lot of Jewish people. Are there anyone from Fort Worth? Did I hear? What's up, Fort Worth? Cowtown. Yeehaw. I didn't grow up around any Jewish kids, really. I, I had one Jewish friend in my school. So when I went into BBYO, that was my safe space. That was when I was around Jewish kids. It was really the only opportunity that I had to be around other Jewish kids and maybe get myself in a little trouble. But it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. And the leadership that I gained from it as well, which I wasn't really looking for, but it happened because I was there and I showed up and I participated. Um, and I have the best memories of my life. Um, and, it, and it made, it was where I really realized the importance of Jewish togetherness and Jewish community and also the responsibility of giving back to my community and helping my community. Um, with my fellow Jews. And that is something that I do every single day in my life. I've devoted my life to it. And it's the most important th value that I try to raise my kids with. So BBYO was uh, a life-changing experience for me. Um, I was so happy that it existed in my, in my very small Jewish community of Fort Worth um, because it really, it really was a saving grace for me. I don't know what I would have done, um, I would have had very little Jewish identity without it. And for that, I, I'm forever grateful. Um, and, you know, I just, I look at you guys and I, I'm a little jealous because I feel like you have your whole life in front of you, your whole beautiful future. Um, you, you guys really are the leaders of tomorrow. I mean, the courage that it takes for you to be here as a proud Jew, I'm sure I could only imagine what you must be encountering in your schools. I assume most of you guys don't go to Jewish day school. Um, I know it. I know it's tough out there, and I, I'm so grateful that you guys have the strength to, um, to show up and and to, to be present and also to be loud and proud. So, thank you, and um, I can't wait to get to chat with all of you guys uh, a little bit later. I, I, maybe we'll help uh, make some posters and maybe you guys can sign my cast because I don't know if you saw this, but. Okay, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you guys. Um, it <laughs> I love you, I do, I love you all. I love BBYO with all my heart. Um, it was really inspiring to hear all about your hard work and see what you're doing to help support us. Um, as she said, if you have any questions for Lizzie, you can come talk to her and all of our educators and guests tonight as we break off to prepare for the rally. Yes, you better come see me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me.
I'd like to introduce Sigal Shacha as our next chat as our next speaker. Sigal was born in Israel in Kibbutz Nirim, which is in the Gaza envelope, and lived there for much of her life. She moved to Maryland 11 years ago with her family to pursue her postdoctoral studies at NIH. During the attacks on October 7th, Sigal's family was locked down for hours in their homes, surrounded by terrorists, fearing for their lives. Sigal's aunt and uncle, Nurit and Amiram Cooper, were also taken hostage by Hamas. Sigal is here to share her family story with us, so please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, everyone. I didn't make a grand entrance like Lizzie, but I'm very, very honored to be here, and um, it's really amazing to see all you guys here. So thank you so much for coming. Can you hear me okay? So I just want to start with um, um, disclosure or um, just to say that, you know, some of the things I'm going to speak about are, are difficult to hear. Uh, while I'm not going to go into any graphic details about the horrific things that happened that day, I do think that we have um, a responsibility to remember what happened there, to know the stories, to know what happened, to not look away, because it's our responsibilities as Israelis, as Jews, to remember this and to pass it on to our kids. I know you can think about your own kids right now, but um, and then to your friends in school and to your social networks, so nobody forgets. Um, the atrocities that happened there um, ever. Um, when I thought about what I'm going to talk about today, I thought, how can I choose one story to tell? There's so many stories, so much happened that day, and we still continue hearing stories. Some of these stories are horrific, some are heroic, some of them sound like they were taken from the Holocaust. Um, and then when I think about my story, sometimes I think that I've been through hell, and then other times I think I was so lucky because so many others have way worse stories. Um, but I'm still gonna tell you my story from Saturday morning. I'm gonna say it very briefly, um, well, as brief as I can, and please come afterwards and ask me and talk to me and I can tell you, I can answer all of your questions. I'm happy to answer all of your questions. So my October 7th started very, very early in the morning. My husband woke me up really early. I was really mad at him because that's the only day I can slip in. And he wakes me up so early and he tells me, um, there's a war in Israel. Um, terrorists have occupied Nirim, which is the kibbutz I was born in, and my mom still lives there. So uh, do uh, two of my best friends, my childhood friends, my dear friends live there with their family. Terrorists um, occupied Be'eri, which is the kibbutz where my sister lives with her daughter and her ex-husband and other family relatives. They took over near Oz, which is the kibbutz where my uncle and my aunt lives and many of my friends and their families. And they took over near Am, which is where my cousin and his family lives. So as you can probably understand, I was very stressed. I opened my phone. I saw a million of texts, million of missed calls. Um, I start texting my families and I realized that my mom and my sister and my niece and all of my family are um, locked down in their shelters since 6.30 in the morning when the sirens started. They thought it was just another bomb. Um, they're unfortunately very used to that because this has been going on for the last 20 years. The Gaza envelope, as they call it, those small villages, the kibbutzim there, their um, missiles are, and rockets are being fired on them all the time for 20 years. So they're very used to going to the shelter, but this was very different because pretty soon after they started hearing people screaming in Arabic outside their window, my mom is texting me that she hears Arabic outside the window, that she's hearing um, gunfire on the window of her shelter. They were all hiding in the shelters, but those shelters are meant to protect you from rockets, not from terrorists. So most of them don't even lock from the inside. So, um, I spent many long hours Saturday morning into Saturday noon and afternoon texting with my mom, texting with my sister, trying to figure out what's going on. My sister is reporting. In, in my kibbutz in Nirim, actually, the, the, um, the people were able to, um, the civilians that live there that have weapons were able to take control and to kill most of the terrorists. But in Be'eri, the situation was much worse. There were way more terrorists, and they took over the kibbutz, and they, um, uh, and my sister is texting us, there's someone in my house. There's a terrorist in my house. 
And then she texts, they're shooting at my door. And um, actually, some of those bullets pierced the door because they had special bullets that can go through steel doors. And then, some miraculous way, they just left. They shot at the door, they shot all around the house, and then they just left her house. And then she tells me, I can smell, an hour later she tells me, I smell um, burning, smell, something's burning. And then she's telling me, they're burning down my house. And I'm all along, all this time, I'm texting with my sister, with my mom, with my cousin, with my friends. The only people I wasn't texting with were my uncle and my aunt in Iroz. Um, we later learned that at 7.30 a.m. already, they were kidnapped to Gaza along with um, 75 people from kibbutz near Oz, babies, children, teenagers, just like you, many elderly people. Um, so, how was it, the burning house? So, we later found out that the, her house was actually not burning, it was her neighbor's house that they were burning down. Um, her house was only slightly burned, so she was able to stay there. Um, eventually, both my mom and my sister were rescued. My sister, my mom was rescued around 7 p.m. after she was in the shelter from 6.30 a.m. So imagine you're in bed Saturday morning, you're sleeping, all of a sudden there's a siren, an alarm. You run into the shelter in your PJs. You haven't gone to the bathroom, you didn't drink, you didn't eat, and you stay there until 9 p.m. Some people actually stay there for more than 27 hours. They're only rescued the next day. So. Um, yeah, no, uh, no electricity, so it was very hot, it was dark. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, in retrospect, it was good that they didn't know what was going on because I here watched the news and I knew what was going on. And um, I was close to fainting at, at that point. So at 7 p.m., the army rescued my mom. And around 9.30 p.m., oh yeah, I forgot to say that. At some point, um, my sister, uh, her, um, phone died and they did not have any electricity because the power went down, so we lost contact with her for more than three hours. We had no idea what was going on with her and with her daughter um, for many, many hours. Finally, at 9.30, they were rescued um, under fire. They were rescued by soldiers who took them out of the kibbutz. When she was rescued, she was telling me that she had to carry another woman's baby in her arms because the woman she was seven months pregnant, and she went into labor from the stress of being so many hours in the shelter. So my sister was taking care of her, her baby for um, a few days until that woman could actually be with her baby again. She also told me that when she was rescued with her daughter, she was sitting across from a friend of hers, Ilya, and she couldn't look him in the eyes because she was sitting next to her daughter, and he just witnessed his son being murdered in front of him. I wanted to, to tell you one heroic story that happened um, in Barrie. Um, so my, my niece, my daughter's sister, nothing happened to her. No terrorists came to her, um, to where she was staying. Um, nobody was shooting there. And so apparently what happened is that um, the three young men from the party that took place um, close by, they heard that something was happening, so they ran to Barrie. They found a few weapons uh, from, dead, um, from dead terrorists. They took their weapons and they formed a little squad and they went to the area where the young people live in the kibbutz. They all live in the same area and they just killed all the terrorists that were there. And so all the young people, all the teenagers and the young soldiers and the um, students were all, almost most of them were saved uh, from this kibbutz. So by the end of the day, as I said, we realized that my uncle and my aunt were both kidnapped to Gaza. Their cell phones were localized to Gaza, and there was nobody in their shelter when the army went in. Um, we heard nothing from them from two week, for um, two weeks, and then three weeks ago, um, miraculously, my aunt was released from Hamas captivity. Um, she was telling horror stories about how Hamas um, just smashed her against the wall as they were kidnapped her, kidnapping her, and she broke um, her arm, and um, she was lying on the floor for two weeks in a underground 
uh, in very difficult condition. My uncle is an elderly man, he's 85 years old, he needs medications for his heart, for diabetes, so are so many other um, hostages, and we should not forget about them, and we should do everything we can every day to bring them back, because there are 239 hostages still in Gaza for five weeks, more than five weeks, actually. Um, my family left their homes like refugees. They left with the clothes they were wearing, which was PJs for the most part, um, with nothing. And um, thanks to the kindness and the open heart of the Israeli people, they were able to get everything they wanted. So people are taking care of them all the time. And this really um, makes me, ho make me um, hopeful that, you know, we will prevail because we have a very strong bond, the Israeli people and the Jewish people. And I want to end with just one story of heroism and hope. It's the story of Aya from Kibbutz Berry. I actually don't know her personally. I saw her story online, but it moved me. Um, so Aya was going uh, on a bike ride that morning outside of Berry, and um, she heard people calling her. They told her, come hide here. And those people were two um, Muslim brothers from Rahat, from a, from a city in Israel. They told her, those terrorists, come hide with us. And then um, they were hiding her. They were calling their cousins in Rahat who came there to rescue them. Before they rescued them, they rescued 30 people from the dance festival. These are Muslim people from Rahat. Some of them are Bedouins. Um, and they risked their lives to rescue Jews. And after they rescued 30, more than 30 people from the music festival, they went back to rescue Aya. And as they were rescuing her, um, the army, the Israeli army came, and they thought that they, that, that since they're Muslims, they thought they were terrorists, and they were gonna shoot them. And then Aya told them, no, don't shoot them. They rescued me. So they rescued her, and then she rescued them in return. And I thought it was a beautiful story about how Muslims and Jewish can still live together, can still rescue each other's lives, can still live in peace, so we don't have to fight all the time. And um, I want to say, oh, thank you. I want to say one more thing. Our hearts are broken, but the bond between us, the bond between Israel and the Jewish people, it's unbreakable. And we will prevail, and we will rise stronger, and we will march in the mall tomorrow, and we'll show the world what we're made of. Am Israel Chai. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please come talk to me later. We will now be moving into some different stations around the JCC and then meeting outside at the entrance of the JCC at 8.45. Um, so in the Teen Center, which is upstairs, there'll be sign making for the march. In the auditorium in here, there'll be a kickoff program parent event. In room 111, we'll be writing letters to representatives. Um, and in the gym, we'll be making snap snack bags. In the social hall, there will be a memorial. In the art gallery, there will be letter writing to Maccabees Sayer. And in the IAC room, there will be an open conversation space. You can move around freely and then meet at the entrance to the JCC at 845.